get into embarrassing you too much, just a little bit. Um, I drove Big Red the truck. Um, this is Big Red the boy. <laughs> we have Big Red the F-150. And so I drove Big Red the truck and I'm not used to these lights that you have to shut off manually. That is so hard for me. I, I am so thankful that the nation has looked out for me. They tell me when my tires are low, so my wife can continually say, aren't you going to check that tire? Aren't you going to check that tire? I said, I kicked it before I got in. The tires are fine. But it says it's low. It drives me crazy. Uh, check engine lights and, and um, all these different crazy lights. And then we used to think it was bad when we had the dummy light. Remember when the dummy light was tells you when to shift? Any of you remember that? We used to call it the dummy light. Now it's everything. Turn on. We don't even have to turn on our windshield wipers. My dad gets in the car. It's misting. His just decides for him. It's amazing. Anyway, well, what's that have to do with anything? Absolutely nothing. We are so glad the partials are here. Amen. Thankful that we have had the opportunity to support you in your ministry and allow us to make it our ministry too. And I really believe Amen. that. I love to be able to reach the people of Australia who need Jesus. And God uses you to do it. And I am so thankful for it. We are so thankful for you. The many years of service there and what God has done uh, for and through you in uh, Australia. So, brother, I'm going to give the service to you. Um, you can come on up and do what you would like. And again, thank you for being on missionary to Australia. Amen. It's good to be back here. Uh, you know, we've uh, we've been coming back and forth uh, through Indi uh, through Indiana. Uh, for years now, and we were kind of introduced to Indiana through uh, Clarence Doyle, and uh, you know, I hope that doesn't upset anybody. Yeah, uh, he, he was he was one of the, my greatest friends, really was. He, he helped me so much. I I came in I came in as a young missionary. I used to have hair, yeah, and I was I actually was a lot slimmer. Uh, I guess they say I'm now going back in age because when I was born I was bald and chubby and all that. Going back the same way. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I met Brother Doyle up at uh, uh, Brother Chestnut's church up in Oswego, uh, not Oswego, excuse me, not Oswego, Oswego, uh, Illinois. And Clarence Doyle was there, and uh, he was preaching the missions conference that we were in. And Brother Roy had me sleep on a uh, rollout bed down downstairs of his house. And uh, but there's a TV there, and Brother Doyle watch the news every night and so the only way i could go to bed was brother doyle had to finish watching the news because he had sat on my bed <laughs> and, and so i had to wait till he was done and when he got done then i could sleep yeah and so he and i talked through the through the nights and if you ever knew brother doyle uh, you had to, he had to be a worker and he said we'll find out whether he told brother royce and we'll find out whether this guy is any good or not because i'll have him come down to camp and work well, that that was the beginning of the end, I guess, because I mean, uh, we became good friends and we attended there uh, so much uh, uh, through those years, going to the camps and things like that. But uh, we were induced to Indiana, and, we, and through that we got to you know Brother Riker when he was over in Tynesville and uh, met his son. His son was a lot younger way back then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so. Uh, but all these years, I, I remember people saying years ago that yeah, we'd never make it. And, uh, but, you know, we've been 38 years now and we're to show you. Amen. And, you know, we've started eight churches now. Amen. And we can only say by the, uh, to the glory of God, uh, and by the grace of God, it was done because it was never us. And uh, could you talk to anybody and they say, I don't know about this God. <laughs> yeah, but God's got a way. It, yeah, it's amazing how that, you know, you, you are given by God abilities. And if we surrender that to God, God can take who you are, the way you are, and you'll fit where he places you. Yeah, Amen. and that's the most amazing thing uh, about missions to me, more than anything in the work of God. But I've got a video here, I want to show it to you. Now I have to uh, let you know something uh, right up front. There'll be some wind in this. I, Betty and I uh, wanted to introduce our new ministry. We're gonna be working in the Outback. And so we were at Ayers Rock, we wanted to show you Ayers Rock and, and let you see a little bit of that. Uh, but we had only one day to do this in, 
And the day we, we had to do it, uh, you know, a uh, dust storm came through. It was six kilometers wide coming through. So Ben and I were uh, doing the best we could to get this thing in before the dust storm came. Well, you're going to hear some wind. I'm sorry about that. But at least you'll get to see a little bit of that. And uh, you'll see a picture there, uh, one where Betty's in, in front of a big rock formation, and she's like this. <laughs> yeah, you have to understand, in the outback, there's flies. And so you can't see the flies, but the flies are all around her face, so she's... <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, you'll see one picture there where you see a road and you see nothing but dust, uh, uh, cloud of dust in the road. Well, that's what was coming our way. So you, you see, you see the video, and we'll, we'll explain a little bit more. Hi, we're Larry and Betty Parshall. We're missionaries uh, in the land of Australia. We're out of the Arnold Baptist Tabernacle in Arnold, Missouri. Our pastor is Mr. Blaine Gray. Okay, welcome to Australia. I'm Larry Burke. I'm on the other side of the camera. We're missionaries here in the land of Australia. We're here to tell you what we do. We bring uh, the gospel to the, to the places where the gospel is not preached here in the side of Australia. Australia is a land of about 25 million people. It has such diverse uh, cultures and everything else. The largest church here in Australia is the Catholic Church, so very, very uh, slowly attended. Only 1% of, of any Australians or any people of Australia go to church at all. You know, we have just concluded the, uh, uh, the Columbia Baptist Church, and, uh, you know, and so we uh, just want to tell folks about what God's done for us and what God's been doing. Uh, we've uh, been here since 1983, starting churches. Uh, we have started eight churches now, and Columbia Baptist Church being our last one. You know, we have been different to where no one else goes. We try to try to reach the Aboriginal people as much as possible. In 2018, the Parshals had the privilege of having their son David, his wife Penny, their children, and their daughter Lisa, and Pastor Sam Robinson come for a visit. While they were there, they helped with the services, passed out tracts, and had a wonderful time seeing the sights of Australia. Thank you. 
went back to Australia, which will be uh, hopefully in February, where we started a new side of our work, something we've never done before. We feel like God's move put a burden on our heart to reach the outback of Australia. There's some many little towns back there, such as Denver, Diego, uh, places that are so small that most of will not go to, but they have no room to preach the gospel room. So we'll start a uh, circle down ministry where we'll go into these little towns and we'll go there and tell them the, uh, the message of Jesus Christ. Hopefully we'll be able to learn some. Uh, how about what will come about with uh, our study? And from there, hopefully a church will form. But there's so many small, church, uh, small towns that we need somebody. And so we want to be uh, an answer maybe uh, for those people that God can use to reach the outback of Australia. Thank you for, uh, so much for allowing us to come and be with you. And thank you for the support and help you give to us as we go back. Uh, so please pray for us. And, uh, you know, and pray that uh, God will uh, give us the support and also uh, the power of God to uh, go back. Amen. Well, it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, when I walk our new side of our ministry, we're going to do, you see, like most of the we have gone in, in all these years, we've gone into a town, worked that town just as you do here. We try to reach everyone we can for Christ, knocking on doors, passing out tracts, doing whatever we can to, uh, you know, to get the gospel and build the church in that town. And, uh, but uh, when we finished our last church, uh, you know, we were, we were praying and asking the Lord what he'd have us to do as we knew we were in that transition where they would take another pastor out of the church and we'd move on to where God would have us to go. And, you know, we kept remembering all the places that we had been, and yet we go by these little towns in the outback and, yeah, some of these churches have uh, some of these towns have no churches at all. If they do, it's usually a, a Catholic church or an Anglican church, and it's usually more the Anglican than is Catholic anymore. Uh, and uh, like uh, you know, there's one uh, town there. I don't know if you noticed it, uh, Gehindala. Uh, Gehindala is uh, a town of 36 people. That's all that's there, but there's no church. And missionaries, when they come to Australia, they they think like we all do. I can go to the place where we can be the most effective. Let's go to like Sydney and Melbourne and any bigger city. And we were in Gympie, which had uh, 27,000 uh, people living there, but we had a population around us of farmers and everything else. So we'd come to Gympie. So with all that, we had 48,000. And that's what you usually do. You look to a place that you can be most effective. But Lord kept burning our hearts about these little towns that have no body. Missionaries don't go there. We might pass through the towns or see them as we go someplace else. But God burned our heart more and more for these places. And so what we're going to do, Lord willing, is that we'll go into uh, these little towns like a circuit rider used to. We'll go into the towns, just witness, do what we can. Uh, hopefully get a place where we can get a Bible study, you know, maybe a preaching station, and we'll just try to reach those people for Christ. Go to the next town, and just hopefully we'll, we'll build up places that we can just go back and forth, and uh, and hopefully a church will form. I mean, uh, but in a place like Gandala, with only 36, I mean, you get everybody with only 36, so it'll never be a big church. But the idea is Jesus is going to all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature, not just the big populated places. Yeah, you know, and you know, uh, I kind of thought this is sort of what missions was all about anyway is to go to the places that no one goes, you know, and to reach those who have never heard. And so uh, this is what we plan on doing. Yeah, and uh, I'll just share something with you before we get to the message. If you do want to find Mark chapter 6, that's where uh, I'll take our message from. And I'll try not to uh, go too long, but a uh, couple of things I want to bring out to you. Uh, first of all, is uh, there's a lady who sits back here. She kind of travels with me, and uh, it's my wife. Yeah, I'm going to have her stand. This is the sweetest thing God's ever given me in my life, Betty. And when you support us, you're supporting missionaries. I'm not the missionary, and she's the wife. We're missionaries. I mean, Amen. God has done amazing things through Betty uh, all these years. This last time we were there, she had a ministry. Uh, not many things she asked for, but because we've been in Australia so long, and, and uh, we've had a uh, number of uh, men we've trained uh, for the ministry, 
their wives called Betty and other uh, uh, preachers' wives called Betty and asking her advice, asked her help, and wanted some ideas of what to do uh, in matters that, that come up in church and, and, and uh, in their family lives. So she had this phone ministry. I mean, uh, usually I wouldn't even touch the phone. I just knew it wasn't for me. There'd be calling Betty. Yeah. But yeah, that's something God opened up for her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we were so blessed uh, yeah, uh, to see the way God just put us in places and put things in our lives to be the missionaries. But you know, Australia is, is, an, uh, is an English speaking country, but you know, they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you know that strays uh, wouldn't understand half what you say? Yeah, and uh, you know, and so give you an idea. Uh, I usually tell a little story. I, I think I've told it here in the past, but I'll tell it again because there might be some here that have never heard it. You know, just give you give you an idea of what it's like to hear Australians, uh, and, uh, and especially people of the bush. And people of the bush are sort of like country people or people in, you know, where no one else goes. Uh, but I had a good friend at one point. Uh, and uh, he was a real bushy. I mean, he was, he, he only came into town about uh, once a month or every two months. And I, I met him one day and I, I, I saw him coming. I said, I said, G'day, mate, how you doing? He said, Ah, oh, good. I hate you, dog. I said, I'm doing good. He says, uh, What about you? He said, Oh, mate, right. I'm doing rather right. I said, Well, what's it like coming in? Uh, he says, Oh, I see it's really good. Just saying, all good and I'm the track of me, you can offer right to come back and he came on, so oh the bonga 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 and over the track he goes and boom I caught him on the off and off the bottom and he goes, he popped out for the village and said, took him out, hope he's right. <laughs> yeah, they say if you're speaking tongues you should interpret. Right. <laughs> and so what, what he just said was, Yeah, mate, our friend, I had a really great time coming in. I was going down the track, that's the road. In his youth, that's a truck. And off the right there came a kangaroo, or a kangaroo, he came down bong, 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 says, and as he went over the track or went over the road, I caught him on the upper. You know, when a kangaroo is bouncing, he's going either up in the air or down. So that caught him as he's going up the upper. And it hit him, boom, and over the bonnet, over the hood of the truck he goes, he popped down the boot, the back of the truck, just took one home with the truck. <laughs> yeah, well, that's Australian. Yeah, uh, you find out that a lot of the words that we say here just have totally different meaning. We had a preacher come by, uh, to visit with us, and uh, and he he uh, he was talking to uh, to our church, and he, he was saying how that he was excited to come to Australia, and he's telling a little bit about what it, what it was like when he when he got ready to come. He says, "I got the, uh, I got all my bags packed, and everything was ready to go, just waiting for uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a shuttle bus to take him to the airport." So he he went outside. He says, "I was just kind of sitting around, just waiting for the shuttle bus." He says, "I looked over." Uh, saw my neighbor, he just got a new boat, so I went over there, and the two of us were just kind of fiddling around the boat, just, you know, uh, you know having, having a good old time. Says, and, uh, and I, I remember I put something in the garden, so I asked him if he wanted to see it. And she went up and said, we were fiddling around the garden. And our folks, the whole time, were going, I, uh, I can't believe you're saying it. And he wondered what was going on. You see, when you're fiddling around in Australia, that's what little boys do when they can't make it to the toilet. And they were wondering why he's doing outside the yard and around the boat and out in the backyard, the two of them. And the, they just didn't understand. You know, uh, we were the pastor just recently and he got finished eating. He says, man, I'm stuck. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, Betty and I laughed. But you see, in Australia, when you say you're stuck, you mean you're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch the way you are when you're stuck. Yeah. And then his wife would ask for a napkin. Well, the napkin in Australia is a baby's diaper. So you want to clean one at least. And it's just amazing how we have, we have the same words, but they mean totally different. And, uh, you know, and so, uh, but the people of Australia have such a need. I mean, uh, we've been there all these years, and, uh, but the need is still great. I mean, I guess you can go any place you want to go, and you can probably... Uh, try to win, the, uh, win the people to Christ where uh, you just thought. But God has directed us to the outback this time. And as we ask that you pray for us and be with us as we uh, go back there. It's going to be a different part of the ministry as we, uh, things we've ever done before because we'll be doing a lot more traveling. And so we're, uh, we're going to get a, a four-wheel drive to be able to handle the conditions of the outback. But pray for us also because right now we're getting into the country because of COVID and all this kind of stuff. Things are different. Uh, you know, we know when we go, uh, we're going to go into isolation. But you see, right now they have a limit of how many people can come to Australia. You have to be a, a, a resident of Australia at least 
And uh, so right now we're only allowing 500 people in a month. And so we gotta get on the list, but right now we're in the uh, middle of trying to get our uh, passports renewed. So they, uh, the, straight, uh, the, the United States has our new passports on the way. We're just waiting for them to come. We can't uh, you know, put ourselves on the list until we have those. So you pray for that. But once I said, as I said, when you get into the country, you have to uh, go into isolation, but we also have to pay for it. Yeah, and so it's not one of these things where you just go in. And so they said, for the two of us, Betty and I, they're gonna charge us $3,710 just to sit in their hotel and let them feed us. And we can't go anyplace, can't do anything. But we have no home, we're, we're actually homeless in Australia. We have a car, so at least Betty and I can live in the car. Yeah, and so it does sound like homeless, doesn't it? But you know, uh, we, we, we will get a house once we get there. But when we left, we closed out everything because we didn't want to be in the, uh, a, a problem to the new pastor and everything else. We want them to go ahead, and so we moved on. So you pray for us as we go back to Australia, uh, hopefully this February. Anyway, if you will, open your Bibles, as I said, to Mark chapter 6. Now, I'll try not to keep you too long. It's evening, and uh, I don't know what shows on television. Yeah, uh, I don't want you to uh, you know, go through withdrawals. <laughs> you know, but here's a story in, in the scriptures that uh, most everyone has heard many times. But as I was reading this story in my Bible reading, I came across it. And God kind of showed me something. I want to share that with you. You see, we all yeah, hear messages, don't we? Uh, and good messages. But sometimes we fail to understand the limit of time we have to use what God has just shown us. Yeah. yeah. And I want to share something with you uh, that God showed me. Starting in verse 44 of Mark chapter 6. Would you follow along as I read this? Mark chapter 6, and verse 44. It says, And they did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get to the ship and go to the other side before to Bethsaida, while he sent, the, uh, sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. When the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed he had been a spirit, and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wonder. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, uh, for their heart was hardened. When they had passed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and drew to the shore. We'll stop our reading that. Uh, you know, this story about them in the midst of the sea, I and mean, you've probably heard about this is where Peter walks upon water. You know, we criticize him because he gets that, uh, he, he sees the winds and everything else, and he starts sinking. But yeah, admit, at least he walked on water. Not too many people would say that. Right. Yeah, I heard about a uh, pastor in uh, South Africa uh, of another persuasion, more Pentecostal than anything, and he said God told me he could walk on water if he had faith. So he went out to the flooded waters of, I think, uh, somewhere in the middle of Africa, and he, he had his congregation to watch him. He went out there and he sunk, and they never saw him again. Yeah. At least Peter got, got a chance to walk on some. He didn't walk anywhere. Yeah. But folks, uh, as I was reading the story, I saw something. That, that's what I want to share with you. It, here Jesus is, he's on the shore. And he's just had the miracle of loaves and fishes. He's going to the mountain to pray. He sent his disciples away, and they're going uh, to the other side. That's the will of God. Go to the other side. And as they're going, it says he saw the winds contrary to them. And so all this is taking place. But look what it says. It says, uh, it says he comes to them at what time? In verse 48, it says he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh to them walking upon the sea. He comes to them at the fourth watch. I don't know if, uh, if you know it, but there are four watches in the night. Jesus comes in the last watch, somewhere between three and six o'clock in the morning. He comes to them uh, walking upon the sea, and he's waiting all night. 
The bird where it was, where they went, he found them rolling the fourth watch. Folks, this seems like this is our world's fourth watch. Yeah, I believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe if you're thinking that, that it come, he can, it comes at midnight, yeah, it's about ready to kick on to midnight. I just believe he's coming that soon. I believe Jesus could come so soon uh, he could be here before I finish my next sentence. Yeah, and yeah, if this is like the fourth watch of our world, what do you want to be found doing? Don't you want to be found busy for the Lord, growing your, your watch, uh, doing what God wants you to do? Yeah, and uh, I look at this and I also think of my own life. I believe I'm in my fourth watch of life. I'm more close, closer to death than I am uh, where I was in the beginning. Yeah, and so there's not many, many more days in my life, and uh, God could let me have more, but we know that time closes, doesn't it? You know, and so I want to be found faithful to God in my fourth watch. Amen. Yeah, you know, I want to be found doing what God asked me to do, and I, I need to be effective for God. You know, while I can. You know, a lot of people seem like they're quitting. And Brother Riker uh, uh, and I was talking about friends and acquaintances that we know. And, you know, a lot of us uh, who are older, and of course they're older than I, I'm not trying to pick on them, but, you know, it's true. Uh, you know, we're seeing some of our friends just, you know, pass on and are not in good shape. And, you know, but to be known that we've, we, we've run our course and been faithful to God, this is something that should be important to us. I think this message will be important to you if you'll listen to it to grow the fourth watch. Before going farther, let's do pray. Father, we ask the Lord to be with us and help us as we consider the truths in this passage about how the disciples growed their fourth watch. Lord, I ask that you would help me. I ask that you would guide my mind and my words, help me to say that which is needed under thy instruction, under thy guidance. Lord, I pray that you'll fill me with thy spirit that what is said would be spirit-filled and moving. Lord, direct us, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, when Jesus uh, yeah, shows us this port, uh, portion of, of Scripture, we have to understand what has just taken place. I started reading in verse 44, and in verse 44, they had just completed what? The miracle of the loaves and fishes. 5,000 uh, men women and children uh, have been fed uh, from two, five loaves and two fishes. You know, and as we hear that story, I mean, if, you know, if you've heard uh, many preachers, and it seems like every preacher preaches on there somewhere along the line, you hear so many various stories of what's taken place. I mean, here the crowd has come out to see Jesus. They've come out to, to, to hear uh, what he has to say, but it's gone past time to eat. So he says, let's feed them. And they said, we haven't got anything. There's nothing here to feed them with. And he said, we don't have anything. And they said, well, we have a young lad here, and he's got five loaves and two fishes. And of course, most preachers say, well, that's the boy's lunch. I don't know about you, but I think it's awful big lunch. <laughs> you know, they say, well, he has muffins. You know, I don't know about you, but if you go out and get a muffin, you know, I can't eat five of those things. And maybe some of you guys can, but I can't eat five, five muffins. Uh, but they said they were barley loaves. And in my study, barley loaves were uh, the cheaper type of grain you could, you, you could glean. And these things are usually about this big, the way I, I understand, they're not so thick, and they're just a very hard, heavy bread. Yeah, and I can't, if that's what he had, then I can't see that being his lunch either. And then he said they had uh, two small fishes. And everyone said, well, there's the sardines. Well, I don't know that. Yeah, uh, I don't know how big these fish were. Uh, you know, you see Peter, remember the story where Peter goes to fishing and, and, uh, and his other mate said, we'll go with him? And they, they all get in the boat and they toil all night and they don't have anything. Jesus cries out from the shore, children, you got any meat? And Peter's naked in the boat, remember the story? Yeah, and he said, put over the right side, the net, and so they do, they gather up fish. How many fish did they get, you remember? 153 fish. 153 fish. So, and that's about ready to break with 153 fish. So these have to be big fish. You know, and so uh, you might say, well, are you saying these are big fish when it says small fishes? No, I'm just saying we don't know what the, how big the fish were, but they don't have to be sardines. But if you, even if you had huge salmon, two of these, and five barley loaves this side, or this side, let's get it down this floor. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. That's still not enough to feed 5,000 men plus women. The miracle is the fact that God took something that was not sufficient right. and made it sufficient. Right. He made it enough. And in fact, he made it over enough. Uh, in fact, they, they took back 12 baskets full uh, of the fragments that remained. You know, he didn't have a whole loaf left. He had fragments remaining. You see, you wonder what's coming out of your life. Well, sometimes you feel all you, all you have to give back to God are the fragments. Well, what can you do with a fragment? You give God your all, and God will bless uh, what you give him. And so he took that, and all the disciples had to do was one thing. You come to me with a basket, and I'll fill your basket. And you take that basket over. I don't know if I can walk around, but anyway. Uh, you know, uh, they go out and, and feed people with their basket, and they come back, and this is the will of God for them. Fill your basket, feed the people. Fill your basket, feed the people. Fill your basket. That was all they had to do. And they took, they took this miracle, and uh, they fed all the people. It's become one of the greatest stories in the scriptures that preachers and people remember the, the feeding of the 5,000. When we think about our Lord's miracles, it's always one of the top ones people talk about. Feeding the 5,000. But in that, all the disciples had to do was carry a basket, feed the people. You know, it's really it's still the same thing. We go to God, let him fill our basket, and then we go out and we feed the people. And that's all we're to do. And we just need to be found faithful, doing the task, carrying our basket, uh, going out there and uh, meeting the needs of the people. You know, and then after this, he says, now I want you to go to the other side. So what was the will of God now for these people? Go to the other side. That was the will of God. Yeah, it wasn't to go halfway. What the will of God wasn't to go part way. It wasn't to go on a cruise. It was to get in the boat and roll to the other side. Yeah, and so uh, they jumped in the boat and they took off. But you know, when you start out, yeah, uh, things are pretty easy. You see, for them, their first watch, when they got in the boat and started the other side, things are pretty good because they're strong. You know, they haven't, they haven't done uh, a lot of battling or anything, a lot of rowing, so they have strength. They're excited because they've just seen the miracle. And so when they get in the boat, there's probably a lot of conversation and, and excitement, and there may be a hallelujah here and there once in a while. It might have come up, hey, this was great. Do you see what the Lord did? You know, uh, you see all those people get fed, and they just, yeah, you know, they're excited. They got in the boat. You know, and it's amazing how that you and I, when we come uh, to Christ in those early days, how that, you know, we have an excitement. I know for me, I had an excitement. I, I, I was never raised in church to know anything about it, but uh, the man that led me to Christ, Jim Greenacre, had been witnessing to me for months. And I mean, I've been going through deep conviction. I got to a place I couldn't sleep at night. Uh, I just, I, 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 everything that was going wrong in my life, it seemed like, because God kept talking to me about my soul and how I needed to be saved about my sin. You know, and I, I remember thinking I was going to die uh, and, uh, you know, I thought at one stage uh, the ground was going to open up and swallow me up uh, like uh, the sons of Korah. And I, I thought all this. And the day I was saved, boy, it was amazing. The cleansingness that I had yeah. and the joy I had. Right. And, uh, and something hit my face. It was just this dumb smile it hit my face. I couldn't get rid of it. I was saved going to heaven. And for months I walked around. I'd go to work. I couldn't get this grin off it. I've been battling my, my sin and, and the Savior all this time. You know, and he's trying to bring me to Christ. And finally, I'm saved. And there's a grin there. And people are like, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm just going to heaven. Yeah. Saved, I'm going to heaven. And I tell everybody. And so uh, after I say, uh, yeah, the guy living in Christ, we're, we're having a, uh, you know, like a revival. He says, you need to come get baptized. I said, really? I said, is that the Bible? He said, yeah. You see, I, was, uh, I hadn't been saved long, but I knew you needed to listen to what the Bible said. And so I, uh, I said, if it's in the Bible, let's do it. So I went to church, and Betty and I sat back in the front, uh, and they gave an invitation. Betty and I uh, went forward to get baptized. So you see, we were both saved the same night, around midnight. Yeah. And uh, so we were, I walked up there, and I walked up, and the preacher didn't know if I was saved. Because, see, back then, I was just lost. I mean, I, I was more of a hippie than anything else. They used to have an Afro Fu Manchu. I had all bell bottom jeans and tie dye t shirts, all that stuff. So when I walked up to the uh, to the front, the pastor saw me. He goes, "I don't know about this." And so he says, "What are you here for?" I said, "Here to get baptized." He goes, "Are you saved?" 
We sit down, uh, with Betty and I, and went through the scriptures again, make sure we're saved. But we convinced him. Then he took me and took us back, and he put, put these robes on you. And I was, my mom raised a boy, and putting on a robe just didn't seem right. I was wondering about this church when they start putting robes on, on a guy. It just didn't feel right. But I went back there, and I put it on, and went in, I figured, well, they know more about the Lord's will than I do. And so I put this robe on, went in, stepped in the water, and he, and he put me under water. When I came, I was blind, couldn't see a thing. You might say, well, why? Because all the hair fell over my face. I couldn't see it. I had to pull it back. But the grins were still there. God, I was excited. Yeah, and uh, then the preacher did something. You know, not long after being saved and in the church, he said, Brother Larry, why don't you come up and pray for us? And see, I was an introvert. Still am. But God's taken a lot of that out of me. I couldn't talk to more than three people at a time back then. And, uh, and so I, 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 I went up to the front. I don't know what I prayed. And I went up there sort of like a, I guess you'd say spastic. You know? <laughs> Everything's shaking. The living dead walking or something. I don't know. And I'm heading up to the front. I don't know what I'm, well, I got up there. And I, but I prayed something, I guess. And I, I think I said amen. I don't even know that. And I went and sat back down. Betty had to actually grab my hands because my hands are doing this. Just how nervous I was to pray for the first time. Well, a few weeks, the preacher came up and said, Larry, why don't you teach a Sunday school class for me? I need somebody to cover for me. Would you teach? Oh, man. I couldn't hardly pray. And I wasn't going to teach. I don't even know what to, what to teach. Yeah. And so I went up there and the spirit came upon me. Well, it wasn't the spirit of God. It was the spirit of Elvis. You know, my knees were shaking. And everything, this lip started twitching. And started raising it up there. And I was trying to rub it out of there and, and trying to talk and everything. Else. And, yeah, and it just getting worse. And I rubbed a sore on my lip. Yeah, and here, but this is how it started out. What a blessing. What a blessing. Yeah. And I hope you have that kind of joy about your about your Christian life. How you can look back and say, boy, God was so good in those early days. And God Amen. did so much for me. And, and there's an excitement there. But you come to second watch. Second watch is you know, you're now starting to be pressed a little bit in the way you live for God. You see, in second watch, you now start seeing that it, not everything's rosy in the church. And about second watch, you now start getting people who, uh, you know, you find out aren't really all they say they are. And the devil helps you look around and see what's going on around you, and you start to have to decide, am I following God for God, or am I following God uh, because of the people that's here? You have to make a choice. Because, you see, everybody who goes to church not, may not be walking with God. Right. Inside of a church, sometimes there are people who are lost and they need to be saved. And yet, you, you coming in like I was, who didn't know anything about church, you think everybody's the child of God, just wants to serve God. And I remember in those early days, uh, how that you know, the preacher would come up and he'd do something. He'd say, folks, I just need a little hand. I need somebody to do some mowing for us. Could, anybody here willing to do that? Well, as the new kid on the block, I didn't know how you'd handle these things. And so I'd just shoot my hand up and I'd say, me, pick me. I'd literally just yell it out. Can I have it? Seemed like every job that came along, I got it. Man, it was amazing. I, I, I was new in church, and I got all the jobs. No matter how, how, how many others were there, I got them. And I was doing I was mowing lawns. I was cleaning the toilets. Uh, whatever came, I was doing them all. Then one of the brothers came up to me and said, Brother Larry, you know, you don't have to take every job. I thought, well, what are you saying that for? I said, you want one? She goes, no. I'm not saying that. Well, the devil took that. So working on me and say, how come... He doesn't want a job, but he doesn't want you to do them all. So next time I went to church, and the preacher said we need a little help, he didn't look anyplace else. He just looked down at, at me. I used to sit just here, and right in the very front, because I wanted to be, like I guess like they say, where the fire's at, where they warm. And so we'd sit there, and uh, he looked down at me. For the first time I, I, I'd ever done it, I turned around and looked to see what everybody else was doing. I didn't see a hand, one. For the first time as a Christian, my heart was broken. But the devil says, you see that? No one wants to serve God like you do. And he started to let me see for everybody else and the problem. Wasn't long before I didn't want to go to church anymore. I quit tithing. I quit doing everything that, that, that God had been showing me. I lost my joy. I was so far away from God. I went to the church one day and one of the men came up and put his hand and said, Brother Larry, good to see you. I said, put your hand away. I don't even touch it. Get away from me. 
I mean, I was bitter. I went home and I was arguing with God on my front steps, I sort of trying to pray, but I was arguing. I, asked, I told the Lord, I said, why did you do this to me, Father? Here you put me all through all that stuff about being saved, and now when I'm saved, I'm, I want to serve you, and you give me people like this. The Lord kind of brought me back. He said, well, who were you serving before? Why did you take all those jobs? I said, because I loved you. He said, what's strange? Is it the people or is it you? And God broke my heart again there on those steps. I said, Lord, I'll do it again. I went back and the preacher said, I need help. I took every job I could get. Him. Guess what? In just a couple months, he said, I need a preacher. Mm. Guess who he called? Mm. Me. That's good. He said, then he said, I need a missionary. Guess who he called? None of them. So he called me. Yeah. Yeah. And so all these years, we had to make a decision. Just do what God wants you to do. Be faithful in that. Second watch. Amen. Third watch comes up. Well, folks, third watch is where you get hurt. Third watch is where you sometimes you don't have the strength. Third, third watch is when you look for those around you. Third watch is now where uh, you, you, you have to make a choice. Uh, will you ever be found faithful in your life? Will you actually be in service to God no matter what? And will you be uh, able to overcome those problems and trials of life? We, you hear a lot of people talk about this time. They say, you didn't put on the whole armor of God. I'm sorry, but the whole armor of God should already be on you. But we say, hey, put on the whole armor. Folks, third watch is going to hit you like a brick. And you're going to be broken you're not going to have the answers to what goes on, and you're going to have to decide, no matter what, I will be where God wants me to be. We have people come against us and do things through the years. We have uh, churches turn against us and everything else. You know, uh, you know, we have to make a decision. I'll be faithful to God no matter what. I remember in more ordination, I guess they ask every uh, young man who's ever been ordained this question, what will you do uh, if uh, we don't ordain you? My answer was, I'll preach anyway. Yeah, and that's how you feel. Because you see, this is uh, the call of God for your life, but you don't want to be out there without under the sanction of the church. You do want to be under the sanction of the church. You want them to, to agree with you and be behind you and all that. But that's the, that's the idea that you just have to make that choice. But how many Christians fall apart and, and mess up? You see, about third watch, we lose a lot of our congregation. I had my pastor tell me years ago, he says, uh, uh, you get only about seven years of service out of most Christians. Seven years. Faithful service where they'll be busy serving God. Only seven years. They might be in church for a lot longer, but you get those seven years. Yeah, and if I were to ask you if you've been here more than seven years, you'd probably say, oh yeah, I've been here more than seven years. Are you certain? Is Pastor Kelly? I, I, I thought, ah, surely not. Third watch. Third watch. But then comes fourth watch. I tell you what. Fourth watch is the time where the devil has put an onslaught against you. You have no strength. You think of these men who, who have been rowing now. They have been rowing through three watches. And as they've been pulling hard hard in those oars, the wind's contrary, the, the water's coming inside the boat. They have done all they can do. And now uh, their, their arms are probably burning. But they've got to get to the other side. You're in the, you're in the ocean now. And you've got to get the other side. So you're pulling desperately, but you don't have the strength to do it anymore. You don't have the answers anymore. You don't know where to turn to. You look out here, and you think of the crowd that's in the boat with, with these, uh, the Jesus out there. you got Peter, big mouth Peter. He's out there. Hey, oh, aren't you guys helping? Get out of there. You need to pull harder. Come on. And he's out there, and he's overbearing of everybody. That's out. Then you got Thomas over the side. And he said, I don't think we're going to make it. I don't think we're going to make it. I doubt it. I just don't think we're going to make it. you got Philip questioning everything. Well, should we pull? Or should we just put an anchor out? What should we do? And you got, and you got Bartholomew. You know, mine doesn't tell us much about Bartholomew. What's the guy doing in the boat? Boy, you look at that and you think, I don't know. Then you got a disciple whom Jesus loved. Always want to put his head on the breast of Jesus. You know, and, you, and you can see Peter looking at this guy and think, Yeah, you're good for nothing as far as work goes. 
You might love the Lord, but boy, you're not doing anything. Doesn't that sound like church sometimes? You have all these people. A preacher comes up and says, I think we ought to have a revival. You got some back there. I don't think it was going to work. I don't think it would work. <laughs> yeah. And uh, another one's over there side saying, uh, you know, how are we going to handle this? You know, what preacher should we have? Have we got any money for this? Yeah. And it's the same crowd. Just our boat's getting full. Folks, we get tired. We get worn out. I don't have any more strength to do this. I'm in, I'm in my fourth watch. You know, I used to run marathons. Now I don't even want to run, run across the, uh, the lawn. <laughs> yeah. Betty would, will tell you, when, when we were dating, I would climb up walls of houses. I mean, I just, you know, they are picking up, I put my feet like this, and I'd go up the side of a house and get on the roof. You know, any tree that was there, I'd climb up those trees. Now I don't even want to step on a blade of grass that's too high. My knee hurt. My, uh, it seems like everything's happened now in old age. Man. But it's my fourth watch. Where will Jesus find me? Uh, when Jesus comes, where will he find me? Will he find me pulling my oars? Will I be in the strange You know, people say, Brother Larry, when are you coming back? You know, uh, when are you going to retire? Don't you want to see your grandchildren? You know, much as I love my grandchildren, look, I, I, I love my children. The will of God for my life is Australia. He hasn't called me to pastor or evangelism or anything else. He's called me to be a missionary and a missionary to Australia. And so my job is to go to Australia and try to win all those people to Christ that I can. And it doesn't matter how old I'm getting, doesn't matter how my needs feel, doesn't matter what I think I can do or what I can't do. My, the will of God is to go to the other side, and the other side for me is 